So good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Justine Paradiso. I am the Marketing and Programs Manager at the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for coming to our quarterly Community Connections. We are very blessed. Uh, Gretchen was supposed to do this in February, but ended up ill, as everyone is very uh, compassionate about in these uncertain times. And we were very glad that she was able to reschedule for May. So thank you so much, Gretchen, for being here. Before hey, we begin. Before we begin, um, I will have everybody go ahead and introduce themselves and say what organization they're with. Uh, typically, when we're in person, we have this kind of connection as well. So trying to make it as much like the in-person event as possible. So I'll just give you a shout out when it's your turn to just speak. So go ahead and unmute yourself. Feel free to turn your camera on if you'd like to, you know, wave to the people. So, uh, Brad, we'll start with you. Sure. I'm Brad Powers, and I'm with uh, Tyson Supply Company. I'm in a bad hair day today, so I'm going to leave my camera off, but otherwise I'd turn it on. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, Brad. Uh, Sheila. Hi, I'm Sheila Sigurd, and I'm with Manage a Solutions Group here in Dubuque. Thank you. Amy. <gasps> there she is. Good morning, everyone. I'm Amy Schauer. I'm with Stonehill Communities, so I actually work for Gretchen and interested to hear her wonderful talk this morning. So thanks for having us. Thank you. Ryan. Hey everyone, Ryan Semp with the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, um, working on uh, government affairs, uh, external affairs here. Thank Looking you, forward Ryan. to the presentation. Thank you, Ryan. Deanne. Good morning, everybody. This is Deanne Altoff. I am the Mission Advancement and Community Relations Director here at Hills and Dales. Also voted the coolest places to work in 2019, if anybody hasn't yeah. seen the billboard. Very proud of it. Absolutely. Thanks, Deanne. Jason? Good morning, everyone. My name is Jason Henkel. I'm the owner operator at Iowa J Designs, and I'm here. I sit on the board of directors for two different nonprofits, uh, Kids and Timber, which is Tri State Mountain Bike Riders. And so, yeah, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jason. Tammy. Hi, I'm Tammy Black. I'm with Delta Three Engineering. I'm an architect. So, doing design, building changes, let me know. Thank you, Tammy and Travis. Hey, good morning. I'm Travis. Uh, let me turn my camera around here. Hopefully you guys can see me now or no, I guess not. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm, voice. yeah, I have uh, Travis Kirby. I'm with Kirby Realty. Um, been a realtor in the area for quite a while and just opened up my new office here recently. But looking to get more involved in, in some different things. And so I thought I'd check this out. Thank you for being here. And Ron, I know you don't know what we're doing, but we're just going to saying hello and who we are, if you'd like to wish everyone a good morning. Sure, just throw it right on me, Justine. You betcha. Uh, Ron Tegas, uh, Digital Dubuque, I have a small company here in town that does uh, multimedia stuff, uh, photo, video, uh, web, have been involved with the um, Chamber of Commerce for a long time um, and multiple other boards and commissions and uh, city functions. Excellent. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I promised Gretchen I wouldn't read her full bio for her uh, this morning. Um, so uh, just a general thing is just that I met Gretchen when she came to Dubuque. Um, she is a ball of light and energy and we are very blessed to have her in the community and have her here this morning for our community connection. So with that, I uh, turn it over to you, Gretchen. All right, good morning, everyone. I appreciate you joining me today. Um, I'm gonna just really, I've been reflecting a lot on this last year, as I know many of us have, and being in the position I am as CEO of Stonehill, you know, of course, we have uh, experienced the pandemic, no different, but I have to say that I really don't want to focus on the downside of the pandemic. What it really made me think about was, I know I titled this conversation, Leadership Conversations to Remember from 2020. I really think it was, probably should have been titled Leadership Conversations to Remember During 
2020 or before 2020, or it just made me realize that there's been a lot that has happened to me over my, you know, during my journey. And my journey has been many, many years. So I sit here today in my 60s, you know, and I, I don't say that to say, ooh, you know, I, I say that to tell you because the field I've been in, um, in, in leadership capacity has been now for really, really close to 35 years in some type of leadership position. But I say that because I have looked back on my journey and really uh, paid attention to what mattered along the way that really made a difference in my style, my beliefs, I guess my effectiveness. And I looked at how things have formed or developed me along the way. And so I thought I would just share some concepts or just some thoughts. And I certainly will open this up, you know, as we go through these, just for any comments or questions that you may have. But it's basically the question of how did I get to where I am now? And how did that, how did that work, especially during this last year? There's one thing we're never gonna be able to uh, say uh, as we move forward, I mean, not say, if you will, as a group, as a team, as a community, all of us have just experienced a pandemic together. That happens, what, once in 100 years? So I think it's important that we pay attention to these stepping stones along the way and what they, what, how they influence us moving forward, because certainly this last year will influence us. I, I was in a meeting yesterday and someone said, we are all changed. And I believe that to be true, but I believe that we are changed for the better. And that's always my outlook is that you take what influences you. And I always feel like how you apply that is really what matters. So there's just three, kind, three concepts, if you will, that I'm gonna talk about objectives, conversations, or however you wanna title it. I wanna talk about the influence of each of our unique journeys on our leadership effectiveness in general. I wanna talk about the true value of leadership diversity and that different points of view don't necessarily mean that we don't share the same values. And then I also wanna talk about just how you pay attention to your leadership culture, especially when it's tested during a crisis or really just a difficult situation. That is just a very wonderful time to reflect and say, how did we do as a team? So Justine, you can go to the next slide, please. So this is just a beautiful quote that I wanted to share. And it's, it's just the way it reads is, an invisible thread connects those who are destined to meet, regardless of time, place, or circumstance. The thread may stretch or tangle, but it will never break. May you be open to each thread that comes into your life, the golden ones and the coarse ones, and may you weave them into a brilliant and beautiful life. I think the bottom line for me is you will have many things that influence your journey and those threads will, like it says, they'll be coarse, they'll be smooth, they'll tangle, they'll be in line, they'll be whatever you need it to be but you don't get to cut any of the threads out of your life. They are your life. They become, they're with you. You have to integrate those things into your life. So as I talk to you, I wanna just share my own journey. I sit here today as the CEO of Stonehill. If you would have asked me 40 years ago when I was graduating from college and that, if I was going to be in this position, Bottom line, I would have said, hell no, you got the wrong guy. That's exactly what you would have heard from me. So let me talk about my journey because I want to give you the little points in my life that I could have allowed to limit me. I could have allowed the situations to define me or I could have changed my course altogether. So some of these are little teeny weeny little thoughts, but they still could have defined me. And some are quite amusing. So I'm gonna really be quite vulnerable here as I share things, but don't worry, I won't get too, I won't make you uncomfortable. But I'm just to give you my background, I'm, I'm one of seven kids and I am the middle child and I was the first girl. So after three boys, uh, all of my brothers were born a beautiful 10 pounds plus and I was a petite nine pounds, six ounces. <laughs> so 
But when my when I was born, my mom always shared the story that boy, when you were born, Gretchen, I didn't give you a rattle, I gave you a dish towel because you were going to help me with just all the household chores. And really, I don't mean to say back in my day, you know, because I I, I recognize that we've all had our own experiences, but my mom had that focus of this is this is kind of the role we play. She was also, I will say though, futuristically very influential in me going into nursing school. So when I went to high school, I was in a, the only sport we had was volleyball and track for girls. And there was a required course that we were uh, to take as girls. And it was called Secretaries for Tomorrow, where we learned to type on manual typewriters and take shorthand. I did not do well with that course. I was not a good typer. I still am not to this day. And I certainly had no desire to sit at a desk. I was really a people person. But again, I could have let that limit me, but I chose to keep looking forward. During high school, I always drove a clutch or a stick shift car, if you will. It's what got handed down when we got our driver's license. But where I learned to drive clutch, I worked for a flower shop and I was put in charge of driving to a funeral home with, with several bouquets in the back for the funeral that was about to happen. And if you know how to work a stick shift, you know that if you're not smooth with the clutch, it's not going to be a very smooth ride. So what indeed happened is that was one of my first experiences with Kludge. Um, the flowers probably looked worse than the gentleman who was having the service. Let me just say that. And I had to work very quickly to try to throw those things back together to make them look like they were of any use for that service. However, I still love driving stick and I kept with it. I could have let that box truck tell me, you'll never do this again. I worked my way through nursing school. Grades did not come easy. As a matter of fact, I did not get accepted into the nursing school the first time I applied. Again, I could have taken that as a failure, but I kept my eye on the prize and continued to work very hard and I was accepted the following semester, which was wonderful. Because again, I knew nursing from a very, um, very early on, probably when I worked as a CNA in the hospitals uh, going through uh, late, high school that that's what I wanted to do. So I got into my clinicals in nursing. Believe it or not, uh, we were in the clinical with labor and delivery and the newborn nursery. And I we were learning to how to give a bath to a newborn baby. I fainted <laughs> in the demonstration. Needless to say, my instructor pulled me aside after I woke up and was like, Gretchen, we haven't even gotten to surgery yet or any of the other things that you're going to see. If you're fainting when you're seeing a baby bathed, something's going to be wrong here. Needless to say, it was just hot in the room. I'm telling you, I can handle quite a few things, but I did not give my instructor a very good first impression. So with that, I became, I had again, proved myself again. I did fine. I graduated from nursing school. And when I graduated, I had made the, the choice at that time that there were two things I would never go into. Number one, I would never be a pediatric nurse. And the reason I say that is all I would do would be cry with the little ones. I would never have been a person who could have uh, stuck a needle in a little kid's arm and I would have just cried with them. I mean, I, when you can't explain that, I knew I was about adult nursing and that's where I wanted to go. But the other thing I didn't wanna do either was management. And the reason I say that <clears throat> excuse me, is because I had only worked for people who truly looked miserable in management. I had no idea what it, what they did. All I knew that they literally looked like they were miserable people and didn't look like it was any fun. And so as I started evaluating that, I was like, that those two things, forget it. That's why I said to you at the beginning, if you would have told me I was going to be a CEO someday, I would have been, I don't know what Gretchen you're talking about, but it is not me. But then our manager on a clinical unit I was working on, she left and they came to me and said, you're gonna be the manager. I said, you got the wrong guy. I am not gonna be the manager. I said, I don't know what this is about, but I'll tell you what, I am not doing that. They're miserable people and I'm a happy girl. I don't wanna be miserable. Well, I, it was the choice back in that day. It was either take the job or you can go find another one. Well, two little kids and that was not gonna be an option for me. 
So I got into management and it quickly taught me part of my journey again, that I found out that if I was just, if I cared about the people that we, that I worked with, if I was honest, if I treated people with respect, if I could demonstrate to them that I wanted to know what their thoughts and ideas were. And I just, I realized I could influence the environment beyond what I could do with just even doing one-on-one -on -one with patients and that. When I talk about influencing the environment, it was as though the, the employee relations, the employee culture, people were coming to me saying, you know, wow, you know, you really, you're doing this really well. So I just, I, I learned there that being a successful leader had nothing to do with knowing budget and knowing, you know, the ins and outs of technology and knowing how to do an Excel spreadsheet and all of that. It strictly, it started with relationships. And if you could be, if you could impact relationships, you could really influence a huge culture. So since then, I have been in management. So, or leadership, I'd like to call it, because you really aren't managing people you're leading them through, right? So I want to talk to, because I've had along my journey after I went into leadership, I've also worked for some really toxic bosses. And I say toxic because that's exactly what they were. It wasn't like they weren't very effective. They were toxic. They were people that were total authoritarian. They did not care about others. It was all about the power. It was all about their ego. It was all of that. And I, when I worked for them, I, at some times in my life, I was at a point where I didn't have a choice of saying, I don't want to work for this person, I'm quitting. And I say that, I guess you always have a choice, but I'm, I'm sure some of you are at a point where, wow, to think about moving, pulling the kids out of school, you know, I've got little ones, um, my wife right now is in between jobs or whatever the case is, sometimes you just don't have that opportunity or it's just not the right timing in what, whatever the scenario is. So what I just want to say is, if you're in that position with people like that, that you may not be able to change, you can at least not let them change you. And I say that meaning stay authentic to yourself. You may have to deal with it, but you can still influence others in your one-on-one -on -one interactions. You don't need to act as though you're under that person's blanket, if you will. So just remember that, but then, I was also in a position where I was working for a very toxic individual and I did have a choice because my husband and I, our kids were grown, we were both mobile, my husband had recently retired, it was all of this stuff and I left that job because of that individual and that felt very freeing to me but I will tell you that that journey of working even in that environment there was the reason that it really put the icing on the cake as to why I was able and why I was grateful and successful in getting the job I'm in right now. So things just along the way, take them as the stepping stones. As you look back on your journey, don't, I mean, look at, let it teach you. Let it, let it kind of reflect on it. Um, you'll look back and say, that's why, that's why I took a left there. That's why I took a right. That's why I kept going straight ahead. But just know that that whatever's inside you, follow that because that is that is exactly where your satisfaction lies. I can say that now. I mean, I've been through enough of it where it's very obvious to me looking back that the satisfaction truly is is what your heart and where your where your um, passion, if you will, and just really what you want to do. Don't let someone else sell you short. So my final thoughts on this is you don't let your journey define you necessarily, just let it refine you. Uh, your passion, your humility, your hunger, and your willingness to be part of something bigger than yourself is really what matters to the rest of the world and to your own success. That your experience is not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. That whole importance of self-awareness and self-accountability and of course the attitude of doing your best with your best self. I love that statement. I say it all the time at Stonehill. Do your best with your best self. And like I said, just listen to your journey. Watch your journey and let it teach you. So my journey was interesting, uh, but I believe what it helped me do this from this last year 
was I was able to be agile. I was able to change with the flow. I, was, I wasn't gonna let this pandemic define me, but I was gonna just bring my best self to the table and help bring out the best in others. If you go to the next slide, Justine, thank you. So here's really what um, Gary Bernson, uh, Corn Fair, I get a lot of his articles. And if you do not know this gentleman, he does, he's an incredible, just brings out some great points in a, in a weekly um, article that he usually writes. But here's, here's what he says is the real success, the real skill set for successful and effective leaders. The whole piece of accountability, you know, the accountability that we wish to see in others starts in us. In other words, we have to be accountable to ourselves for our own behaviors, meaning you walk the walk, right? You believe it, you say it, you mean it, and you act it. If you aren't accountable to your own self, how can you possibly um, expect accountability from others? That whole belief piece, when we believe we can make a difference, change is possible. I mean, think of the times in my journey. If I, if I fainted in the newborn bath, you know, <laughs> demonstration I could have changed my whole belief saying oh girl you are not cut to be a nurse but I did not do that because deep down my belief was I'm gonna make my I'm gonna be a good nurse I'm gonna be someone that you know I can I can help a lot of other people so change is possible then your actions follow but if we don't believe you won't achieve right and then the capability of course like it says it's a broad brush and it's it's about a lot of things listening and connecting and inspiring giving and getting honest feedback, expanding your networks, exploring with others, you know, constantly looking for opportunities to learn. And it's all, it's all about allowing belief and accountability to shine through actions. So when you think about accountability, belief and capability, recognize this is, a, this is, the, real, this is the real skill set that you look at in a, in a successful and effective leader. You do not see a bullet point that says you need to know budget and Excel sheets and policies and regulations and technology. So remember that. And also, if as leaders, it was so important to, it's easy when things get crazy that we all wanna jump into the weeds. And when you think about going into the weeds, that's you how if you're always into the weeds of your business or of every all the actions and all the opportunities and you never take a step back as a leader and we call it going up on the balcony right if you are not up on the balcony you can't see if everyone i'll call it like a dance floor if you're not watching the dance floor to be sure everybody's in sync and everybody's doing the same thing or they're all aligned in what they're doing you can't see that when you're down there on the dance floor with them you may have somebody to the right doing one dance and somebody to the left doing the other dance. And if you're in the middle of the dance floor, you can't see that. So the importance of pulling back up. And I think this last year, what was so important was that there was times where the leadership team at Stonehill, we couldn't, we had to be in the weeds sometimes because obviously the pandemic, you know, hit our industry, especially hard. It hit everybody hard. So I'm certainly not belittling the effects of everybody. But if our leadership team did not take a chance to step up and monitor things or look at things from the dance, from the balcony, to see that the staff remained in alignment and we were all going in a good direction, we couldn't assure that our team remained in alignment. And if there was one time that we needed to be sure everyone was in alignment with our values and how we do things and the importance of keeping everybody looking forward then that, I mean, that is the only reason that I will say right now that I am couldn't be more proud of our team because all of our staff, we really, we faced it head on. Everybody gave their best with their best selves. It was so interesting to me how there was no drama and no negativity. And even the, you know, so you always have those little pockets, right? Because I mean, we're, we're humans working with humans, but all of that went by the wayside. Everyone truly just brought their best with their best self. But a lot of that had to do with making sure that reminder of uh, we needed to step up and make sure that this was everybody was dancing the same step so that we all felt the synergy and going in the same direction. You can go into the next slide, Justine, please. So when we talk about, um, you know, we've had a lot of discussion at Stonehill, and I'm sure many of you have, of I want to go into the whole piece of leadership diversity. 
And I'm talking about diversity, you know, of course, our backgrounds, our experience, our ethnicity, our, our beliefs, all of that is so important. But I'm really talking about today, the diversity and leadership styles. We, um, we find that there is truly a, a value when you do have diversity in styles. I know when I first uh, came to Stonehill, and this has happened in some other jobs too, so for those of you in leadership capacities, be careful because when you hire someone new, many individuals don't, they don't, they're never told about their own style or off, they're being authentic to their style or being themselves. I had individuals look at me and go, well, that's Gretchen's style and that's the way Gretchen thinks we should do it and that's the way I think we should do it too. Well, I for one don't hire people to just agree with me. I hire people to um, challenge me and I hire people to compliment me with their styles. I don't know everything I, and I don't have the right way to handle everything. I need people that are different from me that look at things um, in it from a different lens that I can really learn from. And you have to be open to it. First of all, I, I would find it extremely boring if all I had around the table is a bunch of head nods that are going, yep, 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 you know, that is that would be so boring for me. And I'm not perfect, so please don't be like me either. I think together we've got a creative, you know, a connectivity and we can all rise together, but we need the differences. And one point that came out in an article in Praise of the Incomplete Leader, as I said, you know, none of us know everything and we're all incomplete leaders. And the minute leaders can know that deep down in their hearts, that, that share that vulnerability of where they aren't, um, where they don't have maybe the strength in a certain skill set to be an effective leader, you know, to be able to say to someone else, you know, you really manage that thing well. Can you help me understand how you do that? Because I, I really, you're so much more effective in that, in that whatever, that behavior or that, that um, situation or whatever it may be, what a compliment to give somebody. I mean, I just think that's incredible. So this, this, this whole quote here from In Praise of the Imperfect Leader, no leader is perfect. The best ones don't try to be. They concentrate on honing in on their strengths and find others who can make up for limitations. You can go to the next slide, Justine. So when we talk about, um, again, this is just another piece with incomplete leaders, uh, they differ from incompetent leaders in that they understand what they're good at and what they're not. Again, that whole vulnerability. If you sit there and think that you can't, to me, the best leaders are those that ask for help. The most competent staff are the ones that ask for help. I don't know about you, but when someone doesn't ask questions or when they seem or act as though they know everything, I get really uncomfortable because then I feel as though they feel like they have to act that way, but they aren't really feeling that way. So when someone when they, someone can really, really talk about what they're not good at and have good judgment about how they can work with others to build on their strengths to offset their own limitations, what a gift that is. And again, I just kind of said that before, it's such a compliment to give someone else to say, I see this in you and you're more effective and I want to be more effective, help me understand, teach me this. That's a huge compliment and acknowledgement to someone else. And it's not about being shameful of saying that, it's about humility. You know, they say the three most important things if you're interviewing someone, it's are they humble, are they hungry and are they smart? So when you think about that, humility comes into play a lot more than we think. So let's continue on the next slide and talk about a little, uh, just kind of that whole uh, diversity and style. Many of you have probably heard of the DISC uh, workforce or profile, you know, work, workforce profile. There's a lot of different ones that are out there and many of us have taken these. Sometimes you're a different color, sometimes you're in a different quadrant. Uh, there's a lot of things, but based on this questionnaire, I, I wanna talk about a little bit because this questionnaire shows your leadership. I'll call it your style, but it's really more about your tendencies. So as tendencies, you can't sit back and say, oh, I'm a D, so therefore this is just how I'm wired, this is who I am, or I'm an I or I'm an S. You can't just fall into that and say, um, you know, I, 
you just have to accept me for who I am. It's about, these are your tendencies, once you take this questionnaire, that tend to come out during stressful or difficult times. So when you look at it, um, this is how we start um, and continue the discussion of diversity and leadership at Stonehill. This is, we have our new managers take this. Uh, we have conversations about this throughout the year. We, if I'm having a conversation with someone, I'll say, okay, I'm seeing that tendency. We talk openly about it because it's really pretty cool to kind of say, woo. So I just want to walk through this a little bit um, and just give you some examples. So when you look at, let's talk, let's start with the upper left. You know, if you come out of taking the questionnaire and you are in the dominant quadrant, this is, these are people that are bit more direct, firm, strong-willed, forceful, and direct, and very results-oriented. They're straight shooters. There's no question. So you may have someone in your um, uh, workplace that is this way. And as I probably talk about these styles, you go, oh yeah, that's that's so-and-so, or oh my gosh, that's so her, or that's so him. So let's go to the upper right-hand corner, the influence. These are people that are very outgoing. And it's not to say that people that are in Ds are not outgoing. So you got to be careful. It's again, tendencies. Outgoing, enthusiastic, optimistic, high-spirited, and lively. Now, if you like, thank you, Justine, for the nice intro. I am out to the edge on the eye. And the further on the edge you are, you kind of call it that you are a real, like very much that way. So, and that does define me. I work with a CFO who is over between the C and D. She is out on the edge there. So the point being is that I, she may, she may see me as someone who kind of, needs to get to the point more. I can talk a bunch, like I'm doing now probably, but need, I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And I got a point I'm wanting to make, but I really want you to hear everything about you know what I'm trying to say. She's sitting over there going, can you just get to the point? I'm really not interested in all this other stuff. Just get to the point. She also may seem to others that I don't think about the consequences because I like quick progress. She wants to know, is the outcome going to be met? You know, is this going to meet the bottom line? She's kind of very, very direct and kind of strong-willed that way. The point I'm trying to make is no matter what quadrant you are, it is your tendency that every person, regardless of where you end up, the dot, if you will, on the circle, everyone is supposed to come to the center. So it's important for me to know what matters to her and her tendency or her style but it's also very important for her to understand mine. If we both come to the center while we're having discussions, how I may, I may communicate to her differently. I need to respect the fact that I need to get to the point. All that does is strengthen the overall relationship and she needs to come to the center too. So it's listening to each other. When you go to the S's, they're steadiness, they're even tempered, very accommodating individuals, very patient, humble, and tactful. We have some, we have a, lar a large group of S's and you can, if you have a lot of people in one quadrant, they think that's cool because, you know, they like each other really well and they all get along and they really don't understand the D's or the I's necessarily or the C's, but they're doing fine. But the S's also need to understand that it's not always about over accommodating people. They can be people that struggle with time management because they want everyone they, they just want to accommodate everyone. They don't want to, um, they don't want to hurt feelings. They're very social. And not that I want to hurt feelings either, but if we have a task at hand, sometimes they bring emotions to the table that may not need to be something you necessarily would consider given the situation. So I don't really have a good example with that. And then C's are very conscientious, analytical, reserved, precise, private, systematic. So they, they, they're by the book kind of people or can have a tendency to be by the book. So this last year for the C's, I'm telling you, we needed everybody. We needed the people that were the steady eddies. We needed people that could influence things. We needed the tendency of being very conscientious because we were learning in real time, right? So, and we needed the dominant people. We needed all of us to come to the center. And it was that kind of diversity. We have a people in every single quadrant. It was that diversity though, where we saw how we truly complemented each other, how we all were recognized our tendencies and didn't let them get in the way, but we brought the strength of our tendencies to the table. So it really helped our team understand what matters to each other 
and how altering our approach with each other just in respect of the other person and their tendencies or style can really make for more effective relationships. Um, I call it, you know, the collective genius, if you will, was so critical this past year, as I mentioned, especially learning in real time. The strength of a team is each individual member and the strength of each individual member is the team. It is never about you. It's never about me. It's about us and how we move forward. So that I would encourage you, if you've not done that with your own teams, I think it's really a, a fun thing to do. Um, but I also want to talk about what we also learned, and I'm going to deviate off a little bit. We had a conversation. I, I serve with Leading Age Iowa um, on the board there, and Leading Age Iowa is our advocacy organization for senior living for nonprofits. Uh, it's a very, it's also a national organization. So the reason I want to bring this up is we had quite a discussion uh, with a group related to, we were trying to say, how are we differentiated as nonprofits? What's the difference between nonprofits and for-profits? And we got into this big discussion about mission and values and how we really care about people and, you know, we, we want quality and all of this. And we really, it was so interesting because we kept talking, thinking, yeah. And then all of a sudden someone who'd worked for a for-profit goes, well, yeah, we had a mission too. We believe in quality too. We have values too. We want the best for the people we serve as well. So it was very enlightening. And my only point of saying anything about this is that whether you have different tendencies, whether you have different thoughts or different points of view, it does not necessarily mean that you do not share the same values. A Critical example for me, I did not share the same values of the individual, the last toxic box I worked. There, that, that was a character flaw to me on his part. And I was, there was no way I shared that. But I have had other individuals that I have worked with that have a very different point of view, but we still want the same thing. And we have a very, very connected uh, thread there because we do share the same values. So it's just the importance of not selling out on your own point of view, but the listening to the other and truly seeing the situation through their lens, because you can both be walking the walk, but if you can join your forces, as far as their strength, there's such strength and partnerships in how our diversity in our approach, we want the same thing, but we may have even a more effective way of approaching it if we really listen to each other. I think it's a good reminder that we can't label other camps. Uh, I think right now in our country, Democrats, Republicans, you know, if we get beyond the labeling of each other and know that we're all wanting a lot of the same things, a good, um, a great America, right? I think that we could get beyond some of those pieces. But when we label and we bring our old biases to the table, that ends up not being a healthy, um, or effective way of managing anything. So, so just remember to not, don't block other thoughts, others' thoughts with your own assumptions. So with that being said, diversity is so important. I believe it is probably what helped the most effective teams do well this last year because they did listen to each other. They paid attention. They looked at it from, we need everybody's head in this. We need a collective genius, if you will. We need to be creative because we need to figure this all out. So I think that when you have that diversity, it is only good. If you are looking to interview with someone where there is not that desire to have diversity, I personally would see that as a red flag. You can go on to the next slide, Justine. Thank you. So the next, um, I guess, concept or discussion is, you know, this whole piece of is your culture or your leadership team crisis ready? And I use crisis just because I think the pandemic had us all thinking about that. But I guess this is kind of is your is your leadership team ready, whether it's good times or in bad. Yeah, right? it's kind of like when you get married, you say in good times or in bad and marriages are tested in tough times. But I think that's the true test of your influence um as a leader on your team i think this comes back to where does the buck stop and making sure that you are helping that you're you're helping lead the team through it knowing that you need to take all of their perspectives and points of views in line 
but it's really about looking back then when you look at is your team leak crisis ready you got a perfect year to look back and say how did we perform how did we respond how did we navigate this last year so this is an excerpt from uh, parker palmer's article leading from within and you know pardon me as i kind of just read it to you but um, it's just a reminder of the influence that we do have. And if you are the one that people are relying to, to be on that balcony or that they're watching because you do set the tone, whether you want to or not, uh, if you're a parent, you set the tone for your kids. If um, there's, if you're a good friend, you set the tone for your relationships with your friendships. It's all of that. But a leader being a person who has an unusual degree of power to project on other people, his or her shadow, or his or her light. Whether you are trying to project your shadow or light, if you have a leadership position, people are watching you. You're on stage whether you want to be or not, and I think most of you know that. A leader is a person who has an unusual degree of power to create the conditions under which other people must live and move and have their being. Conditions that either will be illuminating as heaven or as shadowy as hell. A leader is a person who must take special responsibility for what's going on inside him or herself, inside his or her consciousness, uh, lest the act of leadership can create more harm than good. If you are always looking at this, again, I go back to my toxic boss, that's exactly what he did. It was just all about his own, there was no, I mean, he his consciousness, I don't know if he had one to be honest, but it is just important to know that whether or not you think you have this power and i hope that you're not in leadership positions for power that you're in it to empower others but you still have this that others are going to see so how you how you uh, behave how you respond uh, your your style all of that matters in how you influence others so being an empathetic leader is really that ability to inspire others to believe and enable that belief to become reality you develop them through role modeling and mentoring lead them through a situation you don't tell them necessarily what to do but leading them through sometimes you do need to tell them what to do if they're really lost but connect the dots you know explain the why uh that that was so critical for us this last year to continue to explain to staff we're doing this because this is what we need to you know be sure happens you know we had regulations changing and all of that you know was just going like full throttle but you know you are the message i mean if you want others to to you know achieve their their own potential that's great because that's how you become that's how you get you know collective genius if you will so there was another um thought by uh, ken blanchard and this is a uh, and just another excerpt from an article, as I mentioned, but this is just that whole piece of um, being the role model and the mentor, but I'm just going to read this quick paragraph and it's about helping people get an A. So Ken, Ken Blanchard, who is the leadership guru with whom I've had great discussions, often, not me, I'm reading a paragraph from an article, I wish I could talk to him, often tells a story about his early days as a college professor. His approach was radical. On the first day of class, he gave his students the answers to the final exam. Ken often found himself in trouble with other faculty members, but he defended his decision by explaining that his main job was to teach the students the content they needed to learn, not to evaluate them along some distribution curve. It's a concept he called helping people get an A. What I thought was so cool about this is the it just, reiterates the importance of are you clear on your expectations because if you tell people where you're trying to go what the outcome is again giving them the answers to the final exam you don't leave them guessing i wonder what she's wanting us to do with this or where are we going right i'm the leader which way did they go or they if, if people aren't aligned although all those pieces it's about expectations um Staff often, they'll laugh at me because I, I love football, college football in particular, but I'll often give the football analogy. If I am the quarterback and I'm not calling the play and the end and the, uh, the, um, the running back, they have no idea what play they're going, then how do they know what to do or where to run when the ball gets hiked, right? So you have to articulate the game plan. 
You have to let them know what's expected in the end. You have to know what they have to know what the final outcome is supposed to be. And they'll help you make that happen. The journey is going to be different. There's 10 ways to do something right. But if they know the end result is this, they're going to keep their eye on that prize and they're going to keep maneuvering and they're probably going to make adjustments in how they're approaching or a tackle that they make or whatever the case is. But if you sit there in the huddle and there's no play, I'm going to stand there not having any idea how I'm supposed to be in line with my team, right? So that whole thing of helping people get an A comes back to the whole piece of making your expectations clear. And I will say, I think in some places uh, when we were struggling at Stonehill, that was where we had some of our team that wasn't making the expectation clear or had not connected the dots. So we have to be accountable for that as leaders to make sure we're doing what we're doing. So the next slide, Justine. Thank you. So I just, this is, these are really just in closing uh, comments and then I'm just, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any, but again, I, I hope that I'm just giving you some nuggets of information that maybe you can uh, have uh, thoughtful insight about or just think about it or share with your team. But here's some of my favorite, some of my favorite quotes. Uh, the quality of the leader is reflected, pardon me, the quality of the leader is reflected the standards that they set for themselves. So in other words, if you are not, if your words and actions are not aligned, you might as well forget it. People are going to read right through it, right? The second one is every time you have to speak, you're auditioning for leadership. This goes back to the influence you have, whether you want it or not. Your words matter, so choose them wisely. Sometimes just being quiet and listening is so effective. What's the old saying? You have one mouth and two ears, so you should listen twice as much, right? The third one, to add value to others, uh, you must first find, you, you must first value others. Uh, I think that this is all about great relationships. You, do, you can't have a good relationship if you do not have a mutual respect and a mutual value for each other or see the value in each other. And the task of a leader is to get their people from where they are to where they have not been. Uh, sometimes we have people that have never been to the ocean. So I love the one song I, I used to sing, you know, how do I describe the ocean if you've never seen it, right? So it's really, how do you, how do you give the vision to people so that they can understand where they where you are trying to lead them to go so just in closing ask yourself the question you know how do you influence your environment how do people feel at the end of the day when they're driving home i always love that question when i was driving home after working with a toxic boss that person my i was driving home miserable i was frustrated i was to be quite frank pissed off i was down and if you don't think that that matters when I walk in the door and see my family, it's really tough for me to turn that light switch off. So how people feel when they're driving home at the end of the day after working with you matters not only to um, them and your relationship with them, but to their family. There's a true ripple effect there. It's never about power, like I said before, it's about empowerment. Let that journey teach you that you're on. It's never about failure. It's about what happens the moment after and relationships matter because we are only as good as our ability to connect with one another. I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, those are my thoughts. Uh, I've had a very interesting journey, but I'm still on my journey and I'm loving every minute of it. So uh, I hope that for the rest of you, you are in a good position and can just continue to move forward into this spring and just be, just welcome and embrace your, your journey as you move forward. So thank you everybody. Thank you so much, Gretchen. I, I always love listening to your stories and uh, I never get tired of it. So thank you so much for sharing a little piece of yourself with us this morning. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or if you're more comfortable, put it in the chat. I will let you know that this is being recorded today. I will have it out on our website. So if you found this inspiring and you want to share it with your team or you want to rewatch it on your own, you will have that ability. And if you do have any questions after the fact, I can put you in touch with Gretchen and she would be happy to, I'm speaking for her, yep. but I'm an, I, I know we're well enough, so she'd be happy to answer those for yep. you. Absolutely. I'm trying to practice what you said about, you know, listening more than I speak. That is one of my biggest, biggest yeah. trials. Yeah. Well, you know, what I've had to say has 
there's there's nothing rocket science about this, right? It's just really human nature stuff and reminders of how important that is, uh, regardless of what role you play, right? It's just it's how we treat each other. We yep. that's the golden that's rule, great, right? Yep. Sometimes that's just a great reminder. Tammy. Right. Yeah, so um, so many great quotes and little nuggets of information. And uh, I don't know if there's a way to get some of these slides and like uh, the quotes that are on the slides in some written yeah. form because they're just fabulous. Well, thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Yeah, there, um, there's a lot of different articles that I pulled these from. And so, and I, I think they're all, um, I gave the references in the slides. So I don't have any problem with you sharing the slides, Justine. Okay, perfect. And if you have any follow up with, yeah, I can also, if you have any follow up, just give me a call. If there's anything specific you're looking for, I'm happy to give you that information. Yeah, I will go ahead and put the uh, PowerPoint up with the video once that's all loaded. Okay. Question for you. What is the positive lessons you learned during the pandemic that you hope we never forget? Oh, I mean, I think first and foremost, it's just that gratefulness. I, I think we, you know, there, I think the hard work paid off, you know, before the pandemic even hit, but that gratefulness of the, uh, just the true human connection that it took, I think for all of us, because no one person can go through this and that watching the resilience of all of us, because you were not just facing this in your work life, people lost jobs, you were facing it at home, um, your people with children, God bless any of you with children who were trying to homeschool. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm beyond that stage, but I was, oh, you were in my prayers all the time because that challenge. But I think just the resilience and everybody just kept looking ahead. I think the forward thinking, the for, just looking ahead, we're going to get through this. I think that whole, I think we got this, that we got this mentality, regardless how big it felt, we're going to do it. And that's what I, I was most grateful for and, and so impressed with, with everyone across the board, really, in so many ways. Excellent. I don't see anything else coming in. Um, so one of those is speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much again. Thank you to everyone who joined us this morning for Community Connections. Just a reminder to everybody, I love suggestions when it comes to topics for this. So if you know of a wonderful speaker or a wonderful topic that you'd like covered, this quarterly event will be happening again in August. So feel free to reach out to me. Gretchen, thank you. Always a pleasure. Oh, thanks, everyone. I enjoyed being here this morning. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.